the F1 pod on Off The Ball with Chicago Town Pizza. Formula One? Yeah, we go to town on it. Okay, you're very welcome back to the F1 pod here on Off The Ball. We're at episode 15, I think it is now. We are live weekly between now and the end of the season on Wednesdays after race weekends in the F1 pod podcast feed and the Off The Ball daily podcast feed as well for free wherever you get your podcasts. The F1 pod on Off The Ball is brought to you by Chicago Town Pizza, real takeout taste for less with Chicago Town. We're riding solo in the cockpit this week with John Watson, five-time Formula One Grand Prix champion, uh, race winner. John, how are things? How are you keeping? Well, it's been a bit of a change in the weather for a start off, but the nights are getting longer, the days are getting shorter, and winter's just around the corner. Absolutely. Other than that, everything's pretty good. Yeah, and the clock's going back this weekend coming, which uh, which only adds to the to the evening dullness, I think. Yeah, I wish my body clock could go back as well. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people wish they had that power, John, for sure. Indeed, uh, indeed. Uh, we we have so much to get into with the uh, the US Grand Prix at Austin, Texas, uh, at the weekend just gone, John. Uh, I mean, the, the sprint weekends generally, we, we've kind of had a bit of time for them to bed in now and get used to them. How, how do you find them? Do you enjoy them? Are they something different? Or what will the drivers make of them, do you reckon? Well, uh, in fairness, I, have, I do enjoy them, partly because I think... It, in, it helps get away from predictability. I've talked about this quite a lot. So you've got a one hour session on Friday morning, then you're straight into qualifying for the Grand Prix. Then on Saturday morning, you've got qualifying sprint, and then you've got the sprint race. And I mean, I know that many teams would feel that one hour of running on a circuit isn't enough to do all the work, the homework, particularly around tire selection, tire strategy, and everything to do with the, the Grand Prix itself. And I think maybe that was an example of what occurred in a Cota or Circuit of the Americas, where people went out and if you had a problem, you were out of, really, you're going straight into qualifying for the Grand Prix without any lap times or any backup, no feedback, nothing. So it's a quite a difficult situation. But as I say, one of the problems that Formula One has had over many years is domination, but also predictability. And I think the sprint race and the format, well, I would still like to see it maybe tuned up a little bit and make the qualifying for the sprint race on the Friday and that qualifying for the Grand Prix then be on its normal Saturday slot. That would certainly be more appealing to me. But look, I'm not in control and uh, Formula One's doing a reasonably good job, in fact, a very good job at conveying entertainment as well as Grand Prix racing to the public. Yeah, you feel like maybe the extra race... Uh, adds a bit of excitement, certainly to to Formula One fans that are ch- kind of just coming into the sport. That it adds that extra bit of of intrigue and and bumper to bumper action, I suppose. Well, one of the things it did back in Qatar, it enabled a rookie driver, my hero Oscar Pretorius, to win his first Grand Prix. I mean, an amazing achievement and a great job by McLaren because they've literally turned their fortunes on their heads. Uh, suddenly, really after the Austrian Grand Prix. And they've been on the podium with Lando Norris the last four Grand Prix. So a remarkable turnaround in that. And in part, whether that's to do with the sprint race or that's just coincidental. Uh, certainly what we saw in Qatar, I thought was extremely impressive from, from Oscar Piastri and, and from McLaren in general. Um, and I guess it's one of those races, as you say, it adds complications, but also the the, the Cota track itself, John, maybe talk to us a little bit about that track because... When you see it on television, and I've been at it in person myself, but that that hill uh, on that straight at the very, very beginning is is quite remarkably steep. Well, if you walk the racetrack, I've done it, and it's a real long burner going from the pits or going from the start line, let's say, all the way up to turn one. It's a very steep climb and a very short sort of area of space. And racing cars, likewise, when they hit that hill, obviously it allows them to break that a little bit later because they're slowing down effectively, not by much, but they are slowing down. But the difficulty with turn one is finding the apex, and because it's quite a wide entry and a rather sort of narrowish exit, it does lead to moments taking place up in that, particularly in the opening lap, but also we saw in the race, again, Lando Norris, and I've again commented on this previously, when he is being challenged, and it's notably by, by Lewis Hamilton, he does make some very late moves, which I feel I don't think he should be doing that. I mean, make your move, but don't do it at the sort of 13th hour where you partly compromise. And Lewis, because he's so good, so experienced and so knowledgeable, and he can read 
another competitor, was prepared for it, and that allowed him to go out to the left, start to the right, and then make the undercut coming off turn one. But it is a very steep incline, and uh, I mean, you wouldn't want to be doing a run of the circuit. If you're going to run the racetrack, you might want to run the anti-clock. No, it is it is an anti-clockwise circuit. You might want to run it clockwise. <laughs> Run it the other way around, yeah. Get that yeah. downhill at the, the very end. You get the downhill at the end. <laughs> Might make you more. Still have to climb the hill, but the climb. If you're doing it clockwise, the climb is actually a slightly more gentle climb than it is if you're doing it counterclockwise. Yeah, for sure. That might be the the smarter way of going about things. There's a lot of talk about track, you know, track limit violations and that sort of thing. At Coda, it seems to re- rear its head at at different tracks, maybe more than others. Um, are, are the rules too stringent? Are they there for for safety reasons, and we should all just accept them? Or, or what's your take on those? Well, first of all, in, in Qatar, we sort of trailed that track limits were going to be a problem, certainly at turn 12, which is the first corner at the end of that back straight, and then turn 19, which is the penultimate corner. Turn 19 has always been a problem. And in fact, back in the days when Charlie Whiting, the lovely and great Charlie Whiting was race director, he measured the time lost by running very wide on the exit of turn 19 against the potential time gained. So he wasn't too sort of agitated about people running very wide on the exit of 19 because he felt that any gain was offset by having to travel a further distance. But because the regulations are now being more stringently enforced, track limits at turn 19 in particular, tw- track at 12 also became a focal point. And sometimes you saw cars going wide because the driver just made an error. Other times two cars trying to go through turn 12 side by side, cars get pushed out to the outside of the corner. But Look, track limits are there. They're there for a very good reason. If you don't have a track limit policy, then you get drivers basically just, you may, in my view, it makes a joke of of what this is meant to represent. Formula One is meant to represent the highest pinnacle of motor racing anywhere in the world. And that therefore would apply to the drivers. But if you're seeing drivers just ignoring limits and, and shortcutting or trying to take advantage, to me, that's demeaning what Formula One's all about. Going back to the period when I was racing, or people before me, and, and even some you know, up until probably the last decade or so, when racetracks had very defined racetrack, and then beyond that, it was either something you didn't want to touch, such as a guardrail or a wall, or it might have been the grass, or if you went to Nürburgring, certainly the first time I went to Nürburgring in the, uh, 1970, It was a shock because it was literally tarmac and forest on either side of the racetrack. So that defined track limits. If you wanted to exceed those track limits, meet you in heaven, meet you in heaven. Yeah. That kind of that was that's what it was. So you you ignore track limits consciously to try and gain an advantage. You probably are going to have a big accident and you might end up losing your life. We've so moved on substantially from that time and we don't want to see anybody losing their life. But likewise, there's an element of, I think, pride that any Formula One driver should exercise. And that is to drive within the limits of the racetrack, whether they're defined by a painted white line or a white line and a curb and whatever. You know, it's instinctive in so many drivers now because this is how they've been brought up. They've been brought up with racetracks that have been made so safe that these kind of track limits are there. And it's natural for a human being to try and push those limits. Sneak a bit more, sneak a bit more, sneak a bit more. Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. And I'll come back. And when I mean, I've asked drivers in, in the SRO, the Fanatec GT Europe series that I broadcast in, and they say, look, if it's there, we're going to use it until we get penalized. And then when they get penalized, they complain. So I, I'm not, I'm, in favor of track limits, maybe some of the track limits should be a bigger penalty rather than you getting three sort of warnings before a lap time would be deleted. Mm. Make racetracks, the edge of racetracks, somewhere that you don't actually really want to go near. That's a way of defining a track limit to me. Yeah, for sure. No, it, it would make more sense certainly on paper and 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 for safety reasons, one hundred percent. We will talk. We will talk Mercedes blunders. I guess we'll talk McLaren's uh, bounce back, maybe if you want to call it that. But I suppose the disqualifications, first of all, John from the weekend, um, kind of turned the U.S. Grand Prix on its head. So we heard after the race, uh, Lewis Hamilton and the Ferrari of Charlotte Claire both disqualified 
for what we're told was excessive wear to the skid blocks in the underfloor plank. Now, uh, for those unaccustomed to the the ins and outs of a Formula One car, what exactly uh, does this entail and why exactly do you think they were disqualified? Well, there, there's a thing called a plank, which is actually a piece of, piece of it's not natural, but it's made up of a component or compound. And it is it was introduced in a sense back about 94 or something, or maybe even prior to that. And, and it was a way of trying to restrict cars running very low and gaining a significant amount of aerodynamic uh, performance. And the idea of if you wore your plank out or you wore it beyond a certain threshold, then you could be disqualified. And it's something that's not really reared its head particularly in a very long time. And then all of a sudden, and it was about four hours after the Grand Prix had finished, that the news broke that Lewis Hamilton and Charles Leclerc, their, their let's say, planks, it may have been a skid block, it may have been something else, but part of the underside of the car, the wear on it was beyond the tolerance that is considered to be legal. And they were naturally, uh, and I have to say, disappointingly, in many respects, disqualified. But there are those in the paddock who would say, ah, is that the reason why Mercedes were competitive over the weekend? Or is that the reason why Ferrari were quick in qualifying or whichever? Now, maybe this had a, an indirect relationship to lack of running and focusing on getting through the sprint race and not being able to do all the hard yards of preparation. I don't know. And I'm sure that Mercedes might up this weekend offer up an explanation, as will Ferrari, as to why their cars were found to be illegal once the Grand Prix had finished. There is also another issue about things like uh, uh, technology or respect to the, the rules and regulations. In America particularly, when a race result is concluded, the public leave thinking, we have just seen Lewis Hamilton finish in the podium, Charles Leclerc just off the podium, happy days, Ferrari fans are happy, McLaren, oh, sorry, Mercedes fans are happy. And then they read in the morning, that these two drivers' teams have been disqualified. That's always been an issue, and it, it's a problem when it takes such a long time for the cars to go to Park Ferme, then to be you know, minutely scrutinised. Mm. And again, it's sort of an un, almost unheard of thing that, to hear of a, one, not one team, but two teams having fallen foul of the wear rate of their plank. The indication is it's one of possibly two things, running their car low and in conjunction with a circuit that is bumpy. You could see cars coming down the straight, how much movement within the cockpit the drivers were going through. So it's a combination. But then there were another 18 cars that didn't get disqualified. So they managed to manage the situation. So I don't know what the excuse or the reasons for Mercedes and for Ferrari with those two cars. Because I don't think George Russell got disqualified and I don't think Leclerc got disqualified. Uh, uh, Carlos Sainz got disqualified. So just those two particular cars, I don't know. Hopefully we'll get more news or clearer, uh, clearer reasons as to what caused these two cars to be disqualified. Yeah, certainly the suggestion seemed to be that, that certainly Hamilton's car was running too low. And as you said, that uh, the bumpiest, one of the bumpiest tracks uh, on the on the calendar for sure. Is there a danger, John, of, of things becoming a bit like, as you say, almost like football, where the, the VAR comes in and, and fans are a little bit reluctant to celebrate a goal because they're almost waiting for the decision to come in that, that something has, has, has gone wrong or, get, or there's been a foul or an offside. And similarly in Formula One now, it's, I mean, maybe for some drivers it could be tough to, to even celebrate a podium out of fear that a few hours later it might be stripped away from them. Well, I think, again, it's a function of where the sport has gone. It's an extremely technical sport. We've got extremely uh, able uh, technicians, let's call them that, you know, race scrutineers who look at the car and measure every single item. But the cars, all the teams are likewise, you know, they're fulfilling their obligations to ensure that the cars are within compliance. So it's just strange that within two teams, only one car in each team fell foul. I don't know why the other two driver car combinations didn't. And well, that's a function of how Lewis drives and how Leclerc drives that they find more bumps or whatever. So it, it's, a, it's strange until we get an explanation. And I hope we do get a, a full and fulsome explanation from both teams. But again, because everything is now so regulated and everything can be monitored so accurately that these kind of scenarios are going to probably 
pop up, and especially if you've got a circuit where the surface does degrade over years, and it's something that goes out for some reason, whether it's because of the, the you might call it the winter climate, not that Texas has got a sort of a, a European winter climate, but it does get very cold at night. And maybe the, the nature of the, the land that the circuit is built on, I think it was built on probably what you might call slightly unstable ground, uh, and that might have some factor as well. But it's the same for everybody, and it's the responsibility of those in charge of the team. It's not Lewis's responsibility. It's not Charles Leclerc's responsibility. And here maybe is the, the, the question that some people might want to tease with. If there's a technical fault and a car has fallen foul of the rules, is it fair that the driver has had nothing to do whatsoever with this should be penalised or just the team penalised? Mm. And immediately, immediately, what you're going to have is the cynic saying, ah, what's going on? You're going to find teams will deliberately cheat because if it helps their driver win the world championship, we'll take the hit on our points. But if we get a world, so, you know, whatever, you, whatever way you look at, there's always going to be an angle that's never going to satisfy the entire paddock or the entire uh, organisation or a technical side of Formula One. Yeah, for sure. I, I used the word earlier, blunder uh, or blunders to, to describe Mercedes weekend, John. And um, I, I, I guess it was a moot point in the end, but for a while we had that Hamilton Verstappen Norris battle. It was really exciting and Norris leading in the early stages. Um, but by all accounts, Mercedes, I mean, I guess it's it's strategy again that 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 was the the downfall of their of their of their car, certainly for Lewis Hamilton. Um, and the one stop strategy, I mean, just didn't work. Well, this is why we need Bernie to sit in and give us a Bernie eye <laughs> view of, of the decisions that were made by the teams. Yeah. The teams look at these models, of, they, they've got a model of a one or a two stop strategy. And a part of that will be determined on your grid position as well. So do you think you're going to be able to make a clear break, get away quickly and not get too involved with midfield battles where you're going to put a different type of load or wear rate into your tyres? Teams make these, de these decisions. And I think the, the consensus opinion was, and I think maybe from Pirelli likewise, was the model that they had, that the two-stop strategy was the way, the, the better way. But teams make their decisions, and I don't want to criticise one team for doing something which in their judgment, and I mean, I would bow to their judgment, I don't have the experience and knowledge to know what would be the correct uh, strategy. Bernie certainly would do, but you live by the sword, you die by the sword. The question I think was raised was, was it right that Hamilton waited until Norris made his pit stop? And I think it came in two or three laps following that. Should they have come in, you know, basically not quite following Norris, who was the lead driver car at the time, or did they leave him out, leave Hamilton out maybe a lap or two too long? But those are issues, again, that will have to be discussed by the team and look at it. The thing most encouraging for me was the pace that Mercedes and Hamilton had. And again, going back to Qatar, I felt had that incident in turn one not arisen and Lewis's move around the outside, if he'd gotten away with it, it would have been a mega, mega move. Uh, probably would have taken the lead of the race. And I think that Lewis had enough physical stamina and capacity and a car good enough that I think Mercedes could have won in Qatar. Some might say maybe they could have won in, in, in Texas, that maybe the strategy that they applied might have been the, the mitigation that would have prevented that. But, but sure, I mean, Red Bull are being challenged. They've still got enough in reserve to be able to handle what McLaren are throwing at them, which is extremely impressive. And you're now seeing a resurgence coming from Mercedes. And Ferrari are not a million miles away, but probably not quite at the same level that we're seeing Mercedes. So all of a sudden, while Red Bull have got the quickest driver car pairing out there, it isn't quite as dominant as it would have been mid-season. Yeah, certainly the movements are. And yeah, that dominance, I mean, that's one thing, John, to pick up on that uh, I guess the fans want to see that, the uh, I guess, excitement that we saw in Austin and, and maybe bumper to bumper action and, and a little bit of, I guess battle for for Max Verstappen's number one position. We just have not seen enough of that this season. But I, I guess the weekend shows the teams like Mercedes, teams like McLaren, maybe aren't as far off, maybe as, as, as people think. Is that fair? I think they're closer for sure. But ultimately, and I think this is where Red Bull and, and Max Verstappen are showing great signs of they know they've got the car to get the job done. Mm. And if they're not leading from the light goes out, they are comfortable enough with what they've got. 
and Max has moved on to such a, a degree within himself that he has he, he's not rushing to get to the lead. He's babying the car, and he was complaining of brake issues. We don't know again precisely what that brake issue was, whether it was overheating or excessive wear or whatever, or maybe maybe that was a little bit of the TV show just to make sure that you know we're not being criticised for being so dominant. Whatever it was, it meant that the field was much closer. We had two, actually three other manufacturers, all looking that they're getting closer to Red Bull. But even carrying a brake issue, if that was the, the truth, Max still was comfortable enough to be able to find his way into the lead with what the team did. And once he was there, then, well, OK, people got closer and closer, but nobody actually had an eyeball-to-eyeball, wheel-to-wheel battle with Max. And I think if they got to that situation, I think Max would have had an extra gear available to use. I think he's using what he needs to use in the toolbox. He's probably got a few more bits and pieces available should he need them. But we've not seen that situation really arise, not in the last few races. I want to pick up on, on Max Verstappen in just a second. Do have to take a very short ad break here on the uh, the F1 pod and off the ball. Uh, we have John Watson, the five-time Formula One Grand Prix winner with myself, Shane Hannon. We'll be back in just a second. All right, you're very welcome back to the F1 pod on Off The Ball. It's episode 15, the F1 pod podcast feed, the Off The Ball daily podcast feed, free on Wednesdays after race weekends, wherever you get your podcasts. I want to hear your questions as well. You'll get myself on, on X or Twitter, whatever it's called now, at Hannon one We have John Watson, the five-time Formula One Grand Prix winner with us uh, this week, regular guest on the show. Uh, John, I just did want to touch on, on Max Verstappen. We mentioned him just before the ads. Um, and I guess the word petulant comes up for Max quite often it certainly used to more often more often than it does now um there are a number of bleeps and, and swear words on the uh, the car radio at the weekend between himself and his uh, engineer jean Piero Lambiase. um at one point he called his car a piece of sh1t and and numerous other things uh, i think he was uh, talking about a braking problem as well at one point um and then you see the the presentation and, and him on the podium at the very end booed Quite loudly, it has to be said by the uh, by the American audience or, or vastly American audience in Austin, Texas. I mean, I, I thought we were kind of past this this point of of maybe fans not not appreciating Max Verstappen. Is it because he's so dominant? Well, first of all, I think the, the the communications between driver and the pit lane, where uh, Max is saying, "Don't talk to me when I'm in the braking zone," and he sort of said, "Look, I've got a brake problem." Now, normally, you never hear Max, or certainly. You can manage a brake problem because all you have to do is lift off and coast a little bit. And because he was managing his race, but he seemed tetchy more than normal. And again, what would have led to that? Because we get a fair amount of the radio traffic, but maybe we don't get every bit of it. And I mean, the language wasn't totally shocking, mm. but you know, it was tetchy. So there was something going on between the pit wall. And occasionally, you know, Jean Pierre and Max have a little bit of a a conversation between themselves and sometimes it's a bit harsh but there's a huge amount of respect and admiration between the two people because they're a super super partnership and both you know have made each other almost the, the stars of the show but then when we got onto the podium i think a lot of the reaction that we were hearing were probably from the sergio perez fans mm. uh, who had come up from mexico up to austin to watch the race and because Max, again, the dominant driver by a considerable margin over the last, what, 10 Grand Prix now, I think that was a, it was unfair. I don't like that. I mean, it's, it's like the guy is doing his job. You can't blame him for being so dominant. Both drivers have got the same equipment, we believe. If one driver manages to work with the equipment because that suits his particular style of driving more than the other, I've always said, well, then the team should try and accommodate the, the other driver to give him a car, but the, the way that cars are set up now, it's not like the good old days where springs, roll bars, dampers, whatever. The cars are really set up in a, well, not in the wind hole, but set up in the simulator. And the preparation is all done on the simulator. So they, the team will look for the optimization of the efficiency of the car. In other words, whatever the aerodynamic efficiency is, the mechanical gains, whatever. And it looks to me Max is more capable of driving a car, which would, in my terminology, be a car that is 
you know, a front end car where I get a feeling that maybe Sergio Perez likes a car which he would drive more on the rear wheel. And I know that. I like a rear wheel car myself. I wasn't a driver who drove on the nose because it meant the entry to a corner was the thing that made you hesitant to turn in, get back on the throttle. And I suspect that's maybe a part of where Sergio Perez is right now. I, I think it was mentioned that he wanted to go back to an earlier car setup. And the team said no. Or we believe the team said no, because he was looking back and saying, look, in the early Grand Prix, we had a setup which is different to where we are now. I like that setup. You can see by my performances, I was competitive. I, was, I won a race. Mm -hmm. So why can I not have it? But obviously within engineering, they're saying, no, that is not the quickest way. The way the car is now, the car we are giving you is a quicker car. Get used to it. Learn to drive it. But you know, your human beings are emotional and it's very difficult to make a driver change what is a habit of a lifetime to do something which goes against your instinct or your, your, what your body is telling you. you. You turn the steering wheel and you feel the back end's going to step out. You hesitate to get out of the throttle. Mm -hmm. Or you're not certain that under braking is the car going to be stable. Or when you've made your entry, when you get back on the power, will the back end snap over stable? So all those little things play on your mind. And that's the, the one thing that is different between what happens in the, the factory, the wind tunnel, the simulator, the pit lane. In the race car, on the racetrack, you've got a human being who's susceptible to all these emotions. And, and your body is a massive sensory reception zone. Every part of the car, your body's adrenaline is highlighting every your eyesight, your taste, your smell, your hearing. Every part of your body is so alive beyond anything you'd ever imagine in, in a normal sort of day-to-day -day context. That you know, I don't like the. I think it's going to. I think it's going to oversteer. Or I think it might do this. One of the lessons I was taught uh, was instead of saying what you think the car will do, say what is the car doing. Mm -hmm. So what is the problem, Shane? Why can you not go into cops at Silverstone on a qualifying lap, flat out, 175 miles an hour? And you'll probably say, well, I'm getting some understeer. Actually, are you getting understeer? What you, the core problem actually may not be understeer. That's a secondary co problem caused by the direction of the way you've communicated your problem to the team. And you might have had initially a slightly nervy, unstable rear of the car. You made the compensation in the cockpit. So that once you've made the compensation, yeah, it's better, the car feels better now, then you start to push. But as a consequence of making that compensation, what you have done is actually set the car into a more understeering action. So then you start chasing understeer. Mm. And the, the, the actual real problem has not been understeer, it's been oversteer. So if you can actually just tell your team, why I cannot go quicker? Is it because I'm afraid of the back end snapping and I lose it and I maybe have an accident? Or is it because the front end just is just pushing and it's just not going to turn through the corner? And it's a very important lesson for drivers to learn. On the simulator, all these things can be presented to a driver. And I would think that the level of sophistication that Red Bull and other Formula One teams have is exceptional. So they should be able to make these little different models and try them out. I mean, I would love Max to try a car, for example, of the kind of setup I would like, which is driving from the rear. He would probably say, it's undrivable. The front's just understeering, can't get the front to turn in because he can drive a car that is a more nervy, sort of twitchy entry into a corner. That's his body language, he can deal with it. So I'm assuming that somewhere in that area, there's room for improvement, both for Sergio Perez to try and make an adaptation to what the car actually in its ultimate ultimate, and optimized uh, setup so as he can gain. But if his body is telling him and his brain is then getting the message, don't go there. He's not going to go there. I mean, you have so many cockpit hours built up over the years, John, that uh, you can probably see things from the driver's perspective as well, that sometimes... It is hard to keep your cool. As you said, that something can be going wrong with the car. You're trying to deal with that as well as the high speeds and think of a million other things as well. So, I mean, I guess you of all people can understand that sometimes 
drivers just lose their cool because, as you say, they're emotional human beings. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 not new. It's been around goodness knows for how many generations and years. And I mean, a lot of drivers are of a front end sort of generation. They get it largely through coming through some of the junior formulas. I mean, Formula Three to a large degree, maybe Formula Two slightly less. They've got those cars set up where basically they just put on a shared load of downforce in the front, run it very stiff mechanically, and then deal with it. That's not a car that I think Perez likes, but it might be the optimized way to go quickly. So I, I, again, do the work in the simulator. I think he was in the simulator for a number of days before he came out to uh, to Texas, and maybe some improvements have been made. And I think his performances were better, but it's maybe not at the level it was earlier in the year where he was very strong. Um, we have see- we saw at the weekend as well in Austin, John McLaren overtaking Aston Martin in points uh, into fourth in the constructor standings now. So this is despite, of course, Oscar Piastri's early retirement in the race. But I mean, for, for Aston Martin, Fernando Alonso non-finish, he retired to the pits with, with floor damage. Uh, Lance Stroll ultimately got points as well, uh, finished ninth, but ends up in seventh because of those disqualifications that we mentioned. Um, I mean, McLaren now have a, a six point advantage over Aston Martin. It's hard to see that pendulum swinging back. It appears McLaren have now, I mean, not just moved above Aston Martin in points, but but it, it feels like they're going to push on from there. Yeah, I mean, I think McLaren have got a very, very good car. I mean, Austin maybe wasn't its ultimate circuit, but they recognize that. The, the slower part sec- section, or section three particularly, wasn't going to play to their strengths. But they've got a car that's a very quick car. They've got two super drivers. Aston Martin had, a, at the beginning of the year, they were like the second team to, to Red Bull. But they've not maintained that performance window that they had earlier in the year. And to some degree, they're running, it's a one and a half driver team. You've got Fernando who can race anybody, anywhere, any time of the day. And you know, will drag a performance out. But Lance Stroll, again, is going through a period where it's as if, does he really does he really want to be there? Is there something going on in his mind that's, am I really ultimately going to be a world champion? Am I ultimately going to win a Grand Prix? Win the Grand Prix and then you might win the world championship. So I think that right now, Aston Martin have, if you want to say, treaded water, while those around them have, Court and in the case of McLaren, now I've overtaken them. Mm. One one team we we rarely get to talk about or rarely talk about on on the F one pod, John is is Alfa Tori. And uh, I guess when Daniel Ricciardo was coming back re- uh, recently, we we felt he was going to be the headline taker. But at the weekend, you look at someone like like Yuki Tsunoda, and um, I mean, really really fine race from him. Finishes tenth, becomes eighth with with the disqualifications, and then puts on the soft tires at the end to pick up the uh, extra point for for fastest lap. I mean. It's quite impressive, and I know they're still last in the constructor standings. But I mean, a team we we rarely talk about, and Yuki Tsunoda is. It's hard not to like him. Well, he is a character. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he gets a very irate apparently on the radio, or he used to. <laughs> I think maybe he's calming that down a little bit. Uh, but he is a he's a, a a combative competitor, and certainly uh, when Danny Ricardo came back, was at Hungary, uh, did a great job go to Spa, then Sonoda's reacted and responded and outperformed Danny Ricciardo. And then, of course, Danny got the wrist injury in Zandvoort, comes back. I'm sure that the, the, or the hand injury rather than a wrist injury, still probably not 100%. Uh, and then you're going to have the, 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 the other perception of, well, is he ever going to be back to the level that we know he was capable of? Or have the team made an error by not using Liam Lawson for the remainder of the season. So it's a tough time for Daniel Ricciardo, who's had a, you know, a difficult previous two years at McLaren, and then having you know, the injury he got. So I think the jury's out on that one. Mm. Uh, but everybody loves Danny. He's a great character and personality, as is Yuki Tsunoda. And I mean, where Danny's got this big sort of $100 smile, Yuki's sort of he's physically quite a small guy, but he is you know, but very typical of maybe other Japanese drivers who drive with extreme passion. And that passion sometimes spills over when he's on the radio. Did a good job. Um, and the yeah, Alfa Tori, a team that's the sister team to Red Bull, where maybe they should be further up. 
maybe maybe Yuki Sonoda is is taking over now the role that maybe Danny Ricardo would have been assumed to have held of being the lead driver. And maybe he's building his own level of confidence and coming to a point where he's now sort of comfortable within the arena that he's racing in and uh, getting his head around what it is to be a Formula One driver. There'll be a level of confidence being built around Logan Sargent as well at, at Williams, John, because um, I was reading a weekend a, a stat that was remarkable to me. First F1 World Championship point for an American driver since Michael Andretti at McLaren in 1983 for Logan Sargent at the weekend picked up that final point in 10 after the disqualifications. Yep. Um, I mean, he'd be absolutely delighted with that. Well, I think Logan's had a tough year and he's been under pressure and the media have been giving him a relatively hard time and saying, well, is he going to be a one-hit wonder of one year in Formula One and then moved on? So, I mean, he, he benefited from the disqualifications, but at least he was in position 12th position, that when the two disqualifications were handed out, that he then was getting that single point, both for himself, but for his Williams team. And I'm sure that will make a significant amount of confidence building for Logan. But again, where will he be at the end of uh, at the end of the season? Will he be retained by the team? I mean, he, has, he is bringing funding to the team and, and the Williams team no doubt benefit from that significantly. I think it's James Viles, who's sort of team principal now, maybe that's the right description, would like to see uh, if there's an opportunity for Logan to continue next year. But I think the judgment on that will be not based on, on whatever finance he might bring to the team. It will ultimately be what he brings to the team in terms of results, which equates in another way to the finance that, that the team will generate. So if he can score another two or three points, over the course of the what, four or five races we've got remaining, might be enough for the team to think, well, okay, let's give him another shot and see where he will be. Uh, but you've got Mike, uh, Mick Schumacher hovering around and because he wants to get back into Formula One and would there be a possibility of him going to Williams? Don't know whether that's the case or not. Uh, looking ahead to this weekend, John, at the Mexico City Grand Prix, um... I mean, all all talk, I guess, in build in build to, to Mexico is always circling around Sergio Perez, of course, his home Grand Prix. He's finished third uh, in the last two years in this race, and and yet strangely, I mean, in his third season at Red Bull, and I've seen a few commentators say this that it almost feels like the the year in which he has the least chance of competing for a win compared to the the, the previous couple of years, which doesn't speak very kindly to a, to a driver in his third year at a team. Well, again, it's going to come down to. The car that the team give him is it going to be a car that he can drive in the manner he wants to do in front of his own crowd. And you know, Mexicans are extremely proud of Sergio Perez. He is, a, you know, a, I don't know if he's the biggest sports star, certainly biggest international Mexican sports star, put it that way. I mean, there are boxers and there are probably baseball players and others that I'm not familiar with, but he is right up there with the, the greatest Mexican sportsman uh, currently uh, in their given sport. He will certainly be pushing and doing everything he can within the context of, do I like the car or have I got a car again where I haven't got the confidence? In Mexico, the circuit is dominated by the big, long start, finish straight. And then you've got that series of sort of quickish air spends from about turn four, returning back. And then you've got that stadium section, which I have to say just, okay, it's great for the fans. But there was a fantastic racetrack in Mexico City. The corner that used to be the, the final corner, Peraltada, was just an absolute horse of a corner. Mm -hmm. I mean, loved it to bits. And I would just love to see a current Formula One car going around that corner. Probably would be mind-blowing, the speed. But we don't have it. We've now got a, a circuit which has got a big arena section within it. And that's very important. It's very popular for the fans as well. They get to see the cars. But overtaking, again, is an issue in Mexico. I don't know. I mean, there's no now what I would call real big high-speed corner on the circuit. There's a lot of corners, fourth, maybe fifth gear, but no real sort of hang on. And uh, I mean, for example, the sequence in Austin, turn two, three, four, five. That is seriously big, you know, a big Physical load, same as you saw in Qatar, around the back of the circuit there, high G loads, and you're hanging on. That 
doesn't exist in uh, Mexico now. So it's a, a, the nature of the racetrack is going to be different. And also remember, it's at five and a half thousand feet above sea level. Mm. So the aero on the cars is pro rata lower than it would be at a sea level racetrack. Performance of the motor, the power unit, affects everybody the same way. So it's more or less that sort of cancels itself out. But the aero is a big part of it. And those that have got a lot of aero will be the beneficiaries in Mexico. Um, I love the place and the atmosphere Mexican fans bring to a Grand Prix. Unless you've been there, you just don't, don't understand it. Mm. The, that attitude that you mentioned, John, even uh, thinking back to last year, caused a uh, distinct problem, certainly for, for Ferrari. I mean, the signs and Leclerc qualified fifth and seventh and then finished the race a full minute behind uh, Max Verstappen. And then I guess it was the, the talk of their power unit problems at Mexico last year and it uh, compromised their power unit customers, Haas and Alfa Romeo, as well. But but little things like that, that 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 can impact teams, surely the likes of Ferrari will have learned from that last year, you'd imagine? I think they probably have learned from it, and I'm sure mm. they realised that. Uh, but look again, the simulation they should have been able to simulate on their engine test beds and whatever they do. There's a reduced amount of air going into the engine, so you have to reduce the the fuel to compensate for that. Uh, how do you get around it? Well, you can only get a certain amount of air in, and I don't know what else they can do with the motor. I would assume that they will be more competitive of an embarrassment if they ended up with the, both the customer team and uh, the factory team not being able to do better than they did last year. Can I ask you before we finish, uh, John, there was some interesting news uh, during the week. You, you hear of celebrity, I guess, celebrities investing in different sports of late, and we saw it with Leeds United Football Club uh, in, the, in, uh, in England. Um, but it's, it's, it's leaking into Formula One as well, and Rory McIlroy being one of the, the big names that have joined a group that have invested in the, the Alpine Formula One team, the boxer Anthony Joshua among them. You have the NFL star as well, Patrick Mahomes, uh, the Liverpool and England footballer, Trent Alexander-Arnold. So they've joined up with with Otro Capital, for people who haven't heard this news, which owns 24% um, of Alpine. So their purchase of a 24% stake values the, the Renault-owned team at around £706 million. Uh, and I, I think there's a hope of, of further star names to, to come in and, and raise awareness of Alpine uh, across global sport. We saw Rory McIlroy at the uh, Austin Grand Prix at the weekend. I mean, the likes of this can only be good for the sport, I suppose, John. Well, certainly, I'm having those stars. I mean, Joshua, Anthony Joshua, and Rory, and others. I mean, I saw Rory carrying uh, Esteban Ocon's helmet, <laughs> and the pair of them sort of joking about, "Well, are you my caddy today, Rory?" And Rory <laughs> said, "Oh, I'll carry your helmet." You know, but it, it it made it made good TV, and people love to see this crossover of different sports. And you got you know coming on the back of Europe winning the Ryder Cup. And Rory back in the balls of his feet. From you know, sometimes I wonder what is this guy doing. I mean, he's the most wonderfully naturally talented golfer probably in the world, and he's not winning every tournament or the tournaments you expect him to win. But did he perform in the Ryder Cup? And he looked the old Rory, and you saw him in the grid. And he says, "I love Formula One. I get to watch it, not all the time because uh, maybe well, I don't get to see qualifying so much because I'm normally on the out in the out in the course playing." the Saturday round or the Friday round, but I get to watch the Grand Prix because by the time the Grand Prix comes on, I'm still in my room just getting myself ready to go for the final round. So it's great to have other stars. I don't understand what the particular business model that's been put to these superstars. Um, I'm not a particularly business inclined person, but obviously it's an attractive enough one. No mention of the sums that they've put up either. So is it a million pounds? Is it 10 million pounds? In Rory's case, could be considerably more. Mm. I don't know how much individual uh, sports stars are worth. But having this kind of crossover from boxing, NBA, whatever else, baseball, football, golf, coming in, sounds like a, a bit of very clever business uh, opportunism by the Alpine group. Yeah, seems to make make sense for sure. And it's it's it's... It's heading for Hollywood as well. You've Otro invested back in June, uh, and and Redbird Capital as well that have the actors Ryan Reynolds and and Rob McElhenney. So it's it's certainly interesting. It, it just adds a a little bit of intrigue. It probably it, it probably leans towards the drive to survive fans as well, John. When they see these big names getting involved in the sport, it just maybe brings people from further afield into the sport. I think undoubtedly drive to survive is, but it's got a lot to answer for basically, because it's taken it into. I mean, like this example you've just given with these other sports stars coming in. I suspect you're right. It's a, it's a direct consequence mm. of Drive to Survive and they're sitting at home, hold on a second, 
I fancy a bit of this. What do I need to do? I'd have an association. And if you're, I mean, I don't know how much social media these individual sports stars are a part of, but social media in itself has just gone off the radar uh, over the last, what, three, four years in consequence of, of, of Netflix trying to survive. Mm. Certainly, certainly increased in, in interest for sure. John, before I let you go, the predictions for the Mexican Grand Prix, or do you see anyone, anything but a Verstappen win or maybe a surprise podium or anything that, uh, to, anything to speak of, I guess, that's out of the ordinary? I know it's awfully boring, but I mean, other than something unforeseen, you know, weather, uh, mechanical reliability, incident down in turn one, which can always occur, then I don't see anybody really challenging uh, Max for another victory. I mean, it's awful to say he's just going to keep winning and winning and winning. But I hope, I hope, but because maybe that the, the Red Bull is pretty quick in a straight line, particularly when it's running at CRS, and that straight is such a dominant part of the racetrack, I think it's going to give Red Bull enough of a comfort zone to maintain their position. And one can only hope that whatever work that Mercedes has been doing, Ferrari has been doing, and McLaren, and don't forget, you have two hot young guys in McLaren who are sitting there and everybody else is, is just a target. They're going to target everybody in Ferrari, everybody in, in uh, Mercedes. And a point they can take off those top three teams, they're going to do it. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. John, enjoy the, the Mexican Grand Prix this weekend. And thanks a million as always. Super. Thank you very much, Shane. Brilliant stuff. John Watson there, the five-time Formula One Grand Prix winner. We'll be back, of course, next week, next Wednesday, uh, to react to the Mexican Grand Prix. And that was episode 15 of the F1 pod and off the ball live weekly between now and the end of the season on Wednesdays after race weekends in the F1 pod podcast feed and the off the ball daily podcast feed. We'll speak to you next week. Good luck. The F1 pod on off the ball with Chicago Town Pizza. Formula One? Yeah, we go to town on it.